Hello and welcome to Cosmic Dream Sanctuary. Cosmic Dream Sanctuary is an ecumenical interfaith community dedicated to reading, contemplation, meditation for the embodiment of peace, love, and unity consciousness here and now on earth. So we use readings as a way to connect in with the intelligence of our own self that has expressed itself through history in many different ways. So um, in this reading, you are invited to expand your own awareness, your own awareness of yourself. So oftentimes we think we are simply the reader. We are simply the person who is receiving the information uh, in, the, in the reading or anything like that. But in it, here now, I invite you to simply open up into a field of open uh, mindfulness, right? And then receive the text and communications. And as you do, um, and if, especially if you set aside any of the notions that you need to understand what's going on, set those things aside and simply be present with the reading, the sacred text may actually resonate within you and may create a sense of recollection. You might re recall uh, experiences of some way, of some experience or something like that. <clears throat> the way the readings work here at Cosmic Dream Sanctuary is I will introduce the text very briefly. I will provide a guided meditation for you to tune into that space of openness, of exploration, um, and then I will read the text and then offer a simple uh, benediction sort of experience afterward. Um, like I said, you can listen to this in any way that is meaningful to you. So any way that's meaningful to you, no one is going to grade you on this afterwards. You don't have to come up with clever things to say. You don't even have to pay attention or understand for your intellectual mind what the text is saying. You simply can be present with the <clears throat> words that come through. One of the reasons why I am presenting these sacred texts with video um, and audio and the text itself is for you to have a multimodal way of engaging with them. So in this way, I invite uh, my own self to connect with those sources of wisdom that inspired this reading, that inspired this poem. Right? I'm inviting myself to connect in with the divinity, really, that is inherent in all this world and to invite my body and my mind and my persona to act as a channel, to channel that information, right? <clears throat> so that should come through hopefully in, in some, some level of personality or something like that as we engage with a text. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, you don't, have to, you don't have to do anything at all except for be present with the breath. Um, so I'll introduce the text and then we'll do a little bit of breathing together um, before we go in. This is the Theogony of Hesiod. Theogony means the genealogy or birth of the gods from Theos and Goni or uh, genus. It's the same uh, root word for genus. <clears throat> um, it is uh, written in ancient Greek. It comes from around the 700 BC. It's written by Hesiod, who was a shepherd. Um, he uh, thought to live around the same time as Homer, who wrote the epic poetry of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and so I just offer this image of Hesiod. It's, uh, it's, I think it's really charming. It's, there's this sense of angst actually expressing itself through this, this face. And I often think of um, these early, early Greek thinkers and, and writers, right, as sort of as advanced as we are in terms of our sophistication of intelligence, but also living in a vastly different world. And so there's sort of bridging, <clears throat> bridging this world, Hesiod bridging the uh, ancient past, right? We're not sure exactly what that is, and bridging it into this sort of almost modern, actually, at the, at the time of the Greeks, I would say, because of the writing, because of the 
intellectual discourse at the time. It is is a slightly more sophisticated, actually, than we are now, even though we have such advanced technologies. So this sort of <clears throat> hybrid experience is really being expressed, and that's the that's the experience I see um, in this face. This sort of like half half god half human type experience what is this world right um and so the reason why i uh, chose to offer this text the theogony of hesiod is because um the angels actually the angels i work with in the book of galactic light in the enochian rituals in my exploration of mystic christianity really point to this text they say read it um I've encountered this a variety of times, and I'm particularly attracted to the notion of the gods versus the giants, these titans and the generation of the gods, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure exactly why they're pointing to read this, but um, I'm very curious, and I, I like following their promptings. Um, if you enjoy this, if you are inspired by this reading or the presentation of this material, just know it comes from my own personal contact with angelic, angelic forces, which don't look like the winged beings that you might imagine. They're much rather like frequencies, right? So we did a reading of um, Parmenides on nature, that um, where he has this discourse with a goddess, right? And I invite you there to understand that the goddess might be inside of you, the same way with uh, the reading from Hermes Trismegistus, the divine commander, he literally says this, this divine shepherd lives in his mind as mind, something like that. So without further ado, I will invite you to a posture of re mindful relaxation, whatever that means to you. And that might be you're walking, you're driving, you're sitting, you're laying, you're doing chores, whatever and however you're engaging with it. Just tune into an awareness that you are present here and now and that breath is flowing in and out of your body. Take a few breaths with me here. And just invite the source of all the gods, right? The source of this generation of divinity, the source of wisdom and creativity that expressed itself through Hesiod, that's expressing itself through my voice here and now, and that's expressing itself through your own appreciation of this creative work and your own generation, whatever you're doing. Understand that you are indeed connected to those forces and frequencies and consciousnesses. And you can simply invite them to be present more and more in your life. So do that now to help guide you in your emotive journey as I read the Theogony of Hesiod. <clears throat> From the Heliconian muses, let us begin to sing, who hold the great and holy mount of Helicon, and dance on soft feet about the deep blue spring and the altar of the almighty son of Kronos. And when they have washed their tender bodies in Permesius, or in the horse's spring, or Olimius, make their fair, lovely dances upon highest Helicon, and move with vigorous feet. Thence they arise and go abroad by night veiled in thick mist and utter their song with lovely voice, praising Zeus the Aegis holder and queenly Hera of Argos, who walks on golden sandals and the bright and the daughter of Zeus the Aegis holder, bright eyed Athena, and Phoebus Apollos and Artemis, who delights in arrows, and Poseidon the earth holder, who shakes the earth, and the revered Themis and quick-glancing Aphrodite and Hebe with a crown of gold, and Pheridione, Leto, Iapetus, and Kronos, the crafty counselor, Eos, and great Helios, and bright Selene, Earth too, and great Oceanus, and dark night, and the holy race of all the other deathless ones that are forever. And one day they taught Hesiod, 
glorious song while he was shepherding his lambs under holy helicon. And this word first the goddess said to me, the muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus who holds the Aegis, shepherds of the wilderness, wretched things of shame, mere bellies, we know how to speak many false things as though they were true, but we know when we will to utter true things. So they said, so said the ready-voiced daughters of great Zeus, and they plucked and gave me a rod, a shoot of sturdy laurel, a marvelous thing, and breathed into me a divine voice to celebrate that shall be, shall be and things there were aforetime. And they bade me sing of the race of the blessed gods that are eternally, but ever to sing of themselves both first and last. But why all this? about oak or stone. Come thou, let us begin with the muses who gladden the great spirit of their father Zeus in Olympus with their songs, telling of things that are, that shall be, and that were aforetime with consenting voice, unwearying flows the sweet sound from their lips, and the house of their father Zeus, the loud thunderer, is glad at the lily-like voice of the goddesses as they spread abroad. The peaks of snowy Olympus resound, and the homes of the immortals. And they uttering their immortal voice celebrate in song, first of all the reverend race of the gods from the beginning, those whom earth and wide heaven begot, and the gods sprung of these givers of good things. Then, next, the goddesses sing of Zeus, the father of gods, and men, and they begin and end their strain. How much he is the most excellent among the gods and supreme in power. And again, they chant the race of men and strong giants and gladden the hearts of Zeus within Olympus. The Olympian muses, daughters of Zeus, the Aegis holder. Them in Pyria did Nemosani, who reigns over the hills of Eleuther, bear of union with their the father, the son of Kronos, a forgetting of ills and a rest from sorrow. For nine nights did wise Zeus lie with her, entering her holy bed remote from the immortals. And when a year was past, and the seasons came round as the months waned, and many days were accomplished, she bare nine daughters, all of one mind, whose hearts are set upon song, and their spirits free from care. A little way from the topmost peak of snowy Olympus, there are their bright dancing places and beautiful homes, and besides them the Graces and Himerius live in delight. And they uttering through their lips a lovely voice, sing the laws of all and the goodly ways of the immortals, uttering their lovely voice. Then went they to Olympus, delighting in their sweet voice with heavenly song, and the dark earth resounded about them as they chanted, and a lovely sound rose up beneath their feet as they went to their father. And he was reigning in heaven, himself holding the lightning and glowing thunderbolt, when he had overcome by might his father Kronos. And he distributed fairly to the immortals their portion, and declared their privileges. These things then the muses sang, who dwell on Olympus, nine daughters begotten by great Zeus, Cleo and Euterpe, Thalia, Melopone, and Terpchore, and Eroto, Polyhymnia, and Urania, and Calipi, Calipi, who is the chiefest of them all, for she attends on worshipful princes, whomsoever of heaven nourished princes the daughters of great Zeus honor, and behold him at his birth. They pour sweet dew upon his tongue, and from his lips flow gracious words. All the people look toward him, while he settles causes with true judgments, and he, speaking surely, would soon make wise and even of a great quarrel. For therefore are their princes wise in heart, because when the people are being misguided in their assembly, they set right the matter again with ease, persuading them with gentle words. 
and when he passes through a gathering, they greet him as a god with gentle reverence, and he is conspicuous among the assembled. Such is the holy gift of the muses to men, for it is through the muses and far-shooting Apollo that there are singers and harpers upon the earth, but princes are of Zeus, and happy is he whom the muses love, sweet flows speech from his mouth. For though a man have sorrow and grief in his newly troubled soul, and live in dread because his heart is distressed, yet when a singer, the servant of the muses, chants the glorious deeds of men of old and the blessed gods who inhabit Olympus, at once he forgets his heaviness and remembers not his sorrows at all, but the gifts of the goddesses soon turn him away from these. Hail, children of Zeus, grant lovely song and celebrate the holy race of the deathless gods who are forever those that were born of earth and starry heaven and gloomy night and them that briny sea did rear. Tell how at first the gods and earth came to be and rivers and boundless seas with its raging swell and the gleaming stars and the wide heavens above and the gods who were born of them, givers of good things, and how they divided their wealth and how they shared their honors among them, and also how at first they took many-folded Olympus. These things declare to me from the beginning, ye muses who dwell in the house of Olympus, and tell me which of them first came to be. Verily at the first chaos came to be, but next wide-bosomed earth, forever sure foundations of all, the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus and dim Tartarus in the depths of wide-pathed earth and Eros fairest among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them. From chaos came forth Erebus and dark night, but of night were born Aether and day whom she conceived and bare from union in love with Erebus. And earth first bare starry heaven equal to herself to cover her on every side and to be an ever sure abiding place for the blessed gods. And she brought forth long hills, graceful haunts of the goddess nymphs who dwell amongst the glens of the hills. She bare also the fruitless deep from his waging swell, Pontus, without sweet union of love, but afterward she lay with heaven and bare deep swirling Oceanus, Chaos, and Chiris, and Hyperion, and Epitius, Thea, and Rhea, Themis, and Nemosyne, and gold-crowned Phoebus, and lovely Thetis. After them was born Kronos, the wily, youngest, and most terrible of her children, and he hated his lusty sire." And again she bare the Calliopes, overbearing in spirit Brontes, Stereotypes, and stubborn-hearted Argus, who gave Theus, Zeus the thunder and made the thunderbolt. In all else they were like the gods, but one eye only were set in the midst of their foreheads. And they were surnamed Calliopes, orb-eyed, because one orbed eye was set in their foreheads. Strength and might and craft were in their works. <clears throat> and again, three other sons were born of earth and heaven, great and doughty beyond telling, Cotis and Briarios and Gaius, presumptuous children. From their shoulders sprang a hundred arms, not to be approached, and each had fifty heads upon his shoulders on their strong limbs, and irresistible was their stubborn strength that was in their great forms. For of all the children that were born of earth and heaven, these were the most terrible, and they were hated by their own father from the first. And he used to hide them all away in a secret place of the earth, so soon as each was born, and would not suffer them to come up into the light, and heaven rejoiced in his evil doing. But vast earth ground within, being straightened, and she made the element of great flint, and shaped a great sickle, and told her plan to her dear sons. And she spoke, cheering them, while she was vexed in her dear heart.
My children, gotten of a sinful father, if you will obey me, we should punish the vile outrage of your father, for he first thought of doing shameful things. So she said, but fear seized them all, and none of them uttered a word, but great Kronos, the wily, took courage and answered his dear mother, Mother, I will undertake to do this deed, for I reverence not our father of evil name, for he first thought of doing shameful things. So he said, and vast earth rejoiced greatly in spirit, and set and hid him in an ambush, and put in his hands a jagged sickle, and revealed to him the whole plot. And heaven came, bringing on night and longing for love, and he lay about earth, spreading himself full upon her. Then the sun from his ambush stretched forth his left hand, and in his right took the great long sickle with jagged teeth, and swiftly lopped off his own father's members, and cast them away to fall behind, behind him. And not vainly did they fall from his hand, for all the bloody drops that gushed forth earth received, and as the seasons moved round she bare the strong Irinis and the great giants with gleaming armor, holding long spears in their hands, and the nymph whom they call Melie, all over the boundless earth, and so soon as he had cut off the members with flint and cast them from the land into the surging sea, they were swept away over the main a long time, and a white foam spread around them from the immortal flesh, and in it there grew a maiden. First she drew near holy Cythera, and from there Afterwards she came to see girt Cyprus, and came forth an awful and lovely goddess, and grass grew up about her beneath her shapely feet, her gods and men call Aphrodite, the foam-born goddess, and rich-crowned Cytheria, because she grew amid the foam, and Cytheria, because she reached Cytheria, and Cryopagenis, because she was born in billowy Cyprus, and Philomendes, because she sprang forth from the members. And with her went Eros, and comely desire followed her at birth, at f the first, and as she went into the assembly of the gods. This honor she w has from the beginning, and this is the portion allotted to her amongst men and undying gods, the whispering of maidens and smiles and deceits with sweet delights and love and graciousness. But these sons whom, be, whom he begot himself, great heaven, used to call titans in reproach, for he said that they strained and did presumptuously a fearful deed, and that vengeance for it would come afterward. And night bare hateful doom, and black fate and death, and she bare sleep in the tribe of dreams. And again, the goddess, murky night, though she lay with none, bare blame and painful woe, and the Hesperides, who guard the rich golden apples and the tree-bearing fruit beyond glorious ocean. Also she bare the destinies and ruthless avenging fates, Clotho and Lachius and Atropos, who give men at their birth both evil and good to have, and they pursue the transgressions of men and of gods, and these goddesses never cease from their dread anger until they punish the sinner with a sore penalty. Also deadly night bear Nemesis to afflict mortal men, and after her deceit and friendship, and hateful age, and hard-hearted strife. But ab abhorred strife bear painful toil, and forgetfulness, and famine, and tearful sorrows, fighting also battles, murder, manslaughters, quarrels, lying words, disputes, lawlessness, and ruin, all upon, all of one nature, and oath, who most troubles men upon earth, when anyone willfully swears a false oath. And see begat Nereus, the eldest of his children, who is true and lies not, and men call him the old man because he is trusty and gentle and does not forget the laws of righteousness, but thinks just and kindly thoughts. And yet again he got great Thaumas and proud Phaorius, being mated with earth and fair-cheeked Sato and 
Yeribia, who has a heart of flint within her, and Nereus and rich-haired Doris, daughter of Ocean, the perfect river, were born children passing lovely among goddesses, Ploto, Eurocrotonace, Sio, Amphritie, and Eurdora, and Thetis, Galini, and Glauce, Caimotho, Speo, Theo, and lovely Halie, and Pasithea, and Erato, and rosy-armed Eunice, and gracious Melite, and Eulminie, and Agwe, Doto, Proto, Verusa, Dynamene, and Nesiea, and Actiea, and Protomedia, Doris Panopia, and comely Galatea, and lovely Hippolyto, and rosy armed Hipponone, and Chimodose, who with Chimatolage, and Amphrit. Ite easily calms the waves upon the misty sea and the blasts of raging winds and Simo and Ione and rich crowned Elimide and Glauconomene, fond of laughter and Pontopore, Legora, Eugore and Laomedea and Polynoe and Autonoe and Lysanae and Yorane, lovely of shape without blemish of form, and Samathane, of charming figure, and d- divine Menape, Niso, Eupopene, Themetiso, Pronoe, and Nemeteres, who has the nature of her deathless father, and these fifty daughters sprang from blameless Nereus, skilled in excellent craft. And Thaumas wedded Electra, the daughter of deep-flowing ocean, and she bare him swift Iris and long-haired harpies, Eleo and Osipetes, who on their swift wings kept pace with the blasts of the winds and the birds for as quick as time as they darted along. And again, Sato bare to Phores, the fair-cheeked Gryes, Sisters gray from their birth, and both deathless gods and men who walk on earth called them Grae Pemfrodo, well clad, saffron robed Enyo, and the Gorgons, who dwell beyond glorious ocean in the frontier land of towards the night, where are the clear voiced Hesperides, Thneos, and Uriel, and Medusa who suffered a woeful fate. She was mortal, but the two were undying and grew not old. With her lay the dark-haired one in a soft meadow amid spring flowers, and when Perseus cut off her head, there sprang forth Cryosar and the horse Pegasus, who is so called because he was born near the spring of ocean, and that other because he held a golden blade in his hands. Now Pegasus flew away and left the earth, the mother of flocks, and came to the deathless gods, and he dwells in the house of Zeus, and brings to wise Zeus the thunder and lightning. But Cryosar was joined in love to Kale Ror, the daughter of glorious ocean, and begot three-headed Geranus. Him mighty Hercules slew in sea-girt Eurytha, by his shambling oxen on that day when he drove the wide-browed oxen to holy Tyrannus and had crossed the fords of ocean and killed Orthus and Eurython, the herdsmen, in the dim stead out beyond glorious ocean. And in a hollow cave she bare another monster, irresistible in no wise like either to mortal man or to the undying gods, even the goddess fierce Enchinde, who is half-nymph, 
with glancing eyes and fair cheeks, and half again a huge snake, great and awful, with speckled skin, eating raw flesh beneath the secret parts of the earth, and there she has a cave deep down under the hollow rocks from the deathless gods and mortal men. There then did the gods appoint her a glorious house to dwell in, and she kept keeps guard in Arima beneath the earth, grim Echinda, a nymph who dies not, nor grows old all her days. Men say that Typhon, the terrible, outrageous, and lawless, was joined to her in love, the maid with glancing eyes. So she conceived and brought forth fierce offspring. First she bare Orthos, the hound of Geronis, and then again she bare a second, a monster not to be overcome, that may not be described, Caribus, who eats raw flesh, the brazen-voiced hound of Hades, fifty-headed, relentless and strong, and again she bore a third evil-minded hydra of Lerna, whom the goddess white-armed Hera nourished, being angry beyond measure with the mighty Hercules, and Hercules, the son of Zeus, of the house of Am. Fritian, together with warlike Aeolus, destroyed the up unpitying sword through the plan of Athena, the spoiled driver. She was the mother of Chimera, who breathed raging fire, a creature fearful, great, swift footed, and strong, who had three heads, one of a grim eyed lion, in her hinder part a dragon, and in her middle a goat, breathing forth a fearful blast of blazing fire. Her did Pegasus and noble Bellerophon slay, but Inchinda was subject in love to Orthus and brought forth the deadly Sphinx, which destroyed the Cadmeans and the Nimian lion, which Hera, the, go the good wife of Zeus, brought up and made to haunt the hills of Nemea, a plague to men. There he preyed upon the tribes of her own people and had power over Tratus of Nemea and Apsia. Yet the strength of stout Her Heracles overcame him, and Sato was joined in love to Phorcus, and bare her youngest, the awful snake who guards the apples of gold and the secret places of the dark earth at its great bounds. This is the offspring of Cato and Phaorus, and Thetis bare to ocean, eddying rivers, Neolus and Alpheus, and deep-swirling Erinus, Striamon and Meander, and the fair stream of Easter, and Phaeus and Rasius, and the silver eddies of Elchius, Nasus and Rhodus, Halicomon, Haptoporus, Granchius, and Apsus, and holy Simoeus, and Peneus, and Hermos, and Caoscus, fair stream, and great Sangarius, London, Parthenius, Eunus, Arducus, and divine Scamander. And she brought forth a holy company of daughters, who, with the Lord Apollo and the rivers, have youths in their keeping. To this charge Zeus appointed them, Pieto, and Admete, and Ianthe, and Electra, and Dora, and Primno, and Urana, divine in form, Hippo, Clamine, Rhodia, and Caliror, Zeucos, and Clyte, and Iadia, and Pasitheo, and Plexara, and Galaxara, and lovely Dione, Melobios, and Theo, and handsome Polydora, Caricaeus, lovely of form, and soft-eyed Pluto, Perisis, Ianeras, Acaste, Xanthe, Petrae, and the fair Menistho, and Europa, Metis, Euronome, and Telisto, saffron-clad, Chryseis, and Asia, and charming Calypso, Eudora, and Tyche, Amphoro, and Okoro, and Styx, who is the chiefest among them. These are the eldest daughters that sprang from Ocean and Thetis, but there are many besides. 
for there are 3,000 neat angle, ankle daughters of ocean who are dispersed far and wide, and in every place alike serve the earth and the deep waters, children who are glorious among goddesses, and as many other rivers are there babbling as they flow, sons of ocean, whom queenly Thetis bear, but their names it is hard for a mortal man to tell, but people know those by which they severally dwell. And Thea was subject in love to Hyperion, and bare great Helios, and clear Selene, and Aeos, who do- shines upon all that, all that are on earth, and upon the deathless gods who live in the wide heaven. And Eurybia, bright goddess, was joined in love to Creus, and bare great Astrias, and Pallas, and Perseus, who was eminent among all men in wisdom. And Eos bare to Estrias the strong-hearted winds, brightening Zephyrus and Boreas, headlong in his course, and notice a god mating in love with a god, goddess. And after these, Eregina bare the star Ephorus, and the gleaming stars from which the heavens is crowned. And Styx, the daughter of Ocean, was joined to Pallas, and bare Zelos and trim-ankled Nike, in the house, and she brought forth Crato and Bia, wonderful children. These have no house apart from Zeus, nor any dwelling, nor place, path, except wherein God leads them. But they dwell always with Zeus, the loud thunderer. For so did Styx, the deathless daughter of ocean, plan that day when the Olympian lightener called all the deathless gods to great Olympus and said that whosoever of the gods would fight with him against the titans, he would not cast out from his rights, but each should have the office which he had before amongst the deathless gods. And he declared that he who was without office and right as is just. So deathless Styx came first to Olympus with her children through the wit of her dear father, and Zeus honored her and gave her very great gifts, for he, for her he appointed to be the great oath of the gods, and her children to live with him always. And as he promised, so he performed fully unto them all, but he himself mightily reigns and rules. Again, Phoebo, came to the desired embrace of Coeus. Then the goddess, through the love of the god, conceived and brought forth dark-gowned Leto, always mild, kind to men, to the deathless gods, mild from the beginning, gentlest in all on Olympus. Also she bare Asteria of happy name, whom Perseus once led to his great house to be called his dear wife, and she conceived and bare Hecate, whom Zeus, the son of Cronos, honored above all. He gave her splendid gifts to have a share of the earth and the unfruitful sea. She received honor also in starry heaven and is honored exceedingly by the deathless gods. For to this day, whenever any one of men on earth offers rich sacrifices and prays for favor according to custom, he calls upon Hecate. Great honor comes fully easily to him who prayers the goddess receives favorably, and she bestows wealth upon him, for the power surely is with her. For as many as were born of earth and ocean amongst these she has her due portion. The son of Kronos did her no wrong, nor took away anything of all that was her portion among the former titan gods, but she holds as the division was at the first from the beginning, privilege both in earth and in heaven and in sea. Also, because she is an only child, the goddess receives not less honor, but much more still, for Zeus honors her, whom she will whom she will she greatly aids and advances. She sits by worshipful kings in judgment, and in the assembly whom she will is distinguished among the people. And when men arm themselves for the battle that destroys men, the then the goddess is at hand to give victory and grant glory readily to whom she will. Good is she also when men contented at the games, for 
there too the goddess is with them and profits them, and he who by might and strength gets the victory wins the rich prize easily with joy and brings glory to his parents, and she is good to stand by horsemen, and she will. And those who business is in the gray, discomfortable sea, and who pray to Hakate, the loud, crashing earth shaker, easily the glorious goddess gives great catch, and easily she takes it away as soon as seen, if sh so she will. She is good in the buyer with Hermes to increase the stock. The droves of kine and wide herds of goats and flocks of fleecy sheep, if she will, she increases from a few or makes many to be less. So then, albeit her mother's only child, she is honored among all the deathless gods, and the son of Kronos made her nurse of the young, who after that day saw with their eyes the light of all-seeing dawn. So from the beginning she is the nurse of the young, and these are her honors. But Rhea was subject in love to Kronos, and bare splendid children Hestia, Demeter, and gold-shod Hera, and strong Hades, pitiless in heart, who dwells under the earth, and the loud crashing earth-shaker, and wise Zeus, father of God and men, by whose thunder the wide earth is shaken. These great Kronos swallowed as each came forth from the womb to his mother's knees within this intent that no other of his, the proud sons of heaven should hold the kingly office amongst the deathless gods, for he learned from earth and starry heaven that he was destined to be overcome by his own son, strong though he was, through the contriving of great Zeus. Therefore he kept no blind outlook, but watched and swallowed down his children, and on ceasing grief seized Drea. But when she was about to bear Zeus, the father of gods and men, then she besought her own dear parents, earth and starry heaven, to, to devise some plan with her that the birth of her dear child might be concealed, and that retribution might overtake the great crafty Kronos for his own father, and also for the children whom he had swallowed down. And they readily heard and obeyed their dear daughter, and told her all that was destined to happen, touching Kronos the king and his start houted son. So they sent her to Lytias, the rich land of Crete, when she was ready to bear great Zeus, the youngest of her children. Him did vast earth receive from Rhea in wide Crete to nourish and to bring up. Thither came earth, carrying him swiftly through the black night to Lytias first, and took him in her arms and hid him in a remote cave beneath the secret places of the holy earth on thick wooded Mount Aegeum, but to the mighty ruling son of heaven, the earlier king of gods, she gave a great stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. Then he took it in his hands and thrust it down into his belly. Wretch, he knew not in his heart that in the place of the stone his son was left behind, unconquered and untroubled, and that he was soon to overcome him by force and might and drive him from his honors himself to reign over the deathless gods. After that, the strength of inglorious limbs of the prince increased quickly, and the years rolled on. Great Kronos, the wily, was beguiled by the deep suggestions of earth and brought up again his offspring, vanquished by the arts and might of his own son, and he vomited up first the stone which he had swallowed last, and Zeus set it fast in the wide path earth at goodly Vito, under the glens of Parnassus, to be a sign thenceforth and a marvel to mortal men, and he set free from their deadly bonds the brothers of his fathers, the son of heaven whom his father in his foolishness had bound, and they remembered to be grateful to him for his kindness, and gave him thunder and the glowing thunderbolt and lightning, for before that huge earth had hidden these, in them he trusts and rules over mortals and immortals. Now Iatapis took his took wife to neat-ankled mad Clymene, daughter of Ocean, and went up with her into one bed, and she bare him a stout-hearted son, Atlas. Also she bare him very glorious 
Menotheit, Menoietas, and clever Prometheus, full of various wiles and scattered brained Epimetheus, whom from the first was a mischief to men who eat bread, for it was he who first took of Zeus the woman, the maiden whom he had formed. But Menotheus was outrageous, and far seeing Zeus struck him with a lurid thunderbolt and sent him down to Erebus because of his mad presumption and exceeding pride. And Atlas, through hard constraint, upholds the wide heaven with unwearying head and arms, standing at the borders of the earth before the clear voiced Hesperides. For this lot wise Zeus assigned to him. And ready witted Prometheus, he bound with inextricable bonds, cruel chains, and drove a shaft through his middle and set on him a long winged eagle, which used to eat his immortal liver. But by night the liver grew as much again every way as the long winged bird devoured in the whole day. That bird, Heracles, the valiant son of shapely ankled Alcimene, slew and delivered the son of Iapetus from the cruel plague and released him from his afflictions, not without the will of Olympian Zeus, who reigns on high, that the glory of Heracles, the Theban born, might be yet greater than it was before over the plenteous earth. This then he regarded and honored his famous son, though he was angry, he ceased from the wrath with which he had before, before because Prometheus matched him south in wit with the almighty son of Kronos. For when the gods and mortal men had a dispute at Mekone, even then Prometheus was forward to cut up a great ox and set portions before them, trying to befool the mind of Zeus. Before the rest he set flesh and inner parts thick with fat upon the hide, covering them with an ox paunch. But for Zeus he put the white bones, dressed up with cunning art and covered with shining fat. Then the father of men and of gods said to him, Son of Iapetus, most glorious of all lords, Good sir, how unfairly you have divided the portions. So said Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, rebuking him. But wily Prometheus answered him, smiling softly and not forgetting his cunning. Zeus, most glorious and greatest of the eternal gods, take whichever of these portions your heart within you bids, so he said, thinking trickery. But Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, saw and failed not to perceive the trick, and in his heart he thought the mischief against the mortal men, which also was to be fulfilled. With both hands he took up the white fat and was angry at heart, and wrath came to his spirit when he saw the white ox bones craftily tricked out. And because of this, the tribes of men upon earth burn white bones to the deathless gods upon fragrant altars. But Zeus, who drives the clouds, was greatly vexed and said to him, Son of Iapetus, clever above all, so, sir, you have not yet known your cunning art. So spake Zeus in anger, whose wisdom is everlasting, and from that time he was always mindful of the trick and would not give the power of unwearying unwearying fire to the Melian race of mortal men who live on the earth, but the noble son of Iapetus outwitted him and stole the far-seen gleam of unwearying fire in the hollow fennel stalk, and Zeus, whose thunder on high was stung in spirit and his dear heart was angered when he saw amongst men the far-seen ray of fire. Forthwith he made an evil thing for men as the price of fire. For the very famous limping god formed of earth the likeness of a shy maiden as the son of Kronos willed. And the goddess bright-eyed Athena girded and clothed her with silvery raiment, and down from her head she spread with her hands a broidered veil, a wonder to see, and she, Pallas Athena, put about her head lovely garlands, flowers of new-grown herbs, and she put upon her head a crown of gold which the very famous limping god made her himself, and worked 
with his own hands as a favor to Zeus his father. On it was much curious work, wonderful to see, for of the many creatures which the land and sea rear up, he put most upon it, wonderful things like living beings with voices and great beauty shone out from it. But when he had made the beautiful evil to be the price for the blessing, he brought her out, delighting in the finery which the bright-eyed daughter of a mighty father had given her to the place where the other gods and men were, and wonder took hold of the deathless gods and mortal men, and when, so when they saw that which was sheer guile not to be withstood by men. For from her is the race of women and female kind. Of her is the deadly race and tribe of women who live amongst mortal men to their great trouble, no help meets in hateful poverty, but only in wealth. And as in thatched hive bees feed the drones whose nature is to do mischief by day and throughout the Day, until the sun goes down, the bees are busy and lay the white combs, while the drones stay at home in their covered skeps and reap the toil of others into their own bellies. Even so, Zeus, who thunders on high, made women to be an evil to mortal men with a nature to do evil. And he gave them a second evil to be the price for the good they had. Whoever avoids marriage and the sorrows that woman cause, and will not wed, reaches deadly old age without anyone to tend his years. And though he at last has no lack of livelihood while he lives, yet when he is dead, his kinsfolk divide his possessions among them. And, the, and as for the man who chooses the lot of marriage and takes a good wife suited to his mind, evil continually contends with good, for whoever happens to have mischievous children lives always with unceasing grief in his spirit and heart within him, and this evil cannot be healed. So it is not possible to deceive or go beyond the will of Zeus, for not even the sons of Iapetus Kindly Prometheus escaped his heavy anger, but of necessity strong bands confined him, although he knew many a while. But when first their father was vexed in his heart with Obriaris and Cotus and Gaius, he bound them in cruel bonds because he was jealous of their exceeding manhood and comeliness and great size, and he made them live beneath the wide path earth where he was afflicted, being set to dwell under the ground at the end of the earth at its great borders in bitter anguish for a long time and with great grief at heart. But the son of Kronos and the other deathless gods, whom rich-haired Rhea bare from union with Kronos, brought them up again to the light at Earth's advising. For she herself recounted all things to the gods fully, how that with these they would gain victory and a glorious cause to vaunt themselves. For the titan gods and as many as sprang from Kronos had long been fighting together in a stubborn war with heart-grieving toil, the lordly titans from high Orthri, but the gods, givers of good, whom rich-haired Rhea bear in union with Kronos from Olympus. So they, with bitter wrath, were fighting continually with one another at that time for ten full years, and the hard strife had no close or end for either side, and the issue of the war hung evenly balanced. But when he had provided those three with all things fitting, nectar and ambrosia, which the gods themselves seat, and when their proud spirit revived within them all after they had fed on nectar and delicious ambrosia, then it was the father of men and God spoke among them. Hear me, 
bright children of earth and heaven, that I may say what my heart within me bids. A long while now have we, who are sprung from Kronos and the Titan gods, fought with each other every day to get victory and to prevail. But do you show your great might and unconquerable strength and face the Titans in bitter strife? For remember our friendly kindness and from what sufferings you are come back to the light from your cruel bondage under misty gloom through our counsels. So he said, and blameless Cotis answered him again, Divine one, you speak that which we know well, nay, even ourselves, we know that your wisdom and understanding is exceeding, and that you become a defender of the deathless ones from chill doom. And through your devising we are come back again from the murky gloom and from our merciless bonds, enjoying what we looked not for, O Lord, son of Kronos. And so now, with fixed purpose and deliberate counsel, we will aid your power in dreadful strife and will fight against the titans in hard battle. So he said, and the gods, giver of good things, applauded when they heard his word, and their spirit longed for war even more than before, and they all, both male and female, stirred up hated battle that day, the titan gods, and all that were born of Kronos together with those dread mighty ones of overwhelming strength whom Zeus brought up to the light from Erebus beneath the earth, a hundred arms sprang from the shoulders of all alike and each had fifty heads growing upon his shoulders upon stout limbs these then stood against the titans in grim strife holding huge rocks in their strong hands and on the other parts the titans eagerly strengthened their ranks and both sides at one time showed the work of their hands and their might. The boundless sea rang terribly around, and the earth crashed loudly. Wide heaven was shaken and groaned, and high Olympus reeled from its foundation under the charge of the undying gods, and a heavy quaking reached dim Tartarus, and the deep sound of their feet in the fearful onset and their hard missiles. So then they launched their grievous shafts upon one another, and the cry of both armies as they shouted reached to starry heaven, and they meet together with a great battle cry. Then Zeus no longer held back his might, but straight his heart was filled with fury, and he showed forth all his strength. From heaven and from Olympus he came forthwith, hurling his lightning Gold flew thick and fast from his strong hand, together with thunder and lightning, whirling an awesome flame. The life-giving earth crashed around and burning, and the vast wood crackled loud with fire all around. All the land seethed, and ocean streams, and the unfruitful sea. The hot vapor lapped round the earth-born titans, Flame unspeakable rose to the bright upper air. The flashing glare of the thunder, thunder stone and lightning blinded their eyes for all that were strong. Astounding heat seized chaos and to see with eyes and to hear the sound with ears. It seemed even as if earth and white heaven above came together, for such a mighty crash would have arisen if earth were being hurtled to ruin, and heaven from on high were hurling her down. So great a crash was there while the gods were meeting together in strife. Also the winds brought rumbling earthquakes and dust storms, thunder and lightning, and the lurid thunderbolt which are the shafts of great Zeus, and carried the clangor and the war cry into the midst of the two hosts. An horrible uproar of terrible strife arose. Mighty deeds were shown, and the battle inclined. But until then, they kept at one another and fought continually in cruel war. And amongst the foremost, Cotus and Briarios and Gaius, in state 
for war, raised fierce fighting. Three hundred rocks upon one another they launched from their strong hands and overshadowed the titans with their missiles and buried them beneath the wide path earth and bound them in bitter chains when they had conquered them from by their strength for, for all their great spirit as far beneath the earth the Tartarus. For a brazen anvil falling down from heaven nine r- nights and days would reach the earth upon the tenth, and again a brazen anvil falling from earth nine nights and days would reach Tartarus upon the tenth. Round it runs a fence of bronze, and night spreads in triple line all about it like a neck circlet, while above grow the roots of the earth and unfruitful sea there by the counsel of zeus who drives the clouds the titan gods are hidden under misty gloom in a dank place where are the ends of the huge earth and they may not go out for poseidon fixed gates of bronze upon it and a wall runs all round it on every side there gaius and cotus and great-souled Obarius live, trusty wardens of Zeus, who holds the Aegis. And there, all in their order, are the sources and ends of gloomy earth and misty Tartarus and the unfruitful sea and starry heaven, loathsome and dank, even which even the gods abhor. It is a great gulf, and if once a man were within its gates, he would not reach the floor until a whole year had reached its end. But cruel blasts upon blasts would carry him this way and that, and his marvel is awful even to the deathless gods. There stands the awful home of murky night, wrapped in dark clouds, in front of it, the son of Iapetus stands on, immovably upholding the wide heaven upon his head and unwearying hands, where night and day draw near and greet one another as they pass the great threshold of bronze. And while the one is about to go down into the house, the other comes out at the door. And the house never holds them both within, but always one is without the house passing over the earth while the other stays at home and waits until the time for her journeying come, and the one holds all-seeing light for them on earth, but the other holds in her arms sleep, the brother of death, even evil night wrapped in a vaporous cloud. And there the children of dark night have their dwelling, sleep and death, awful gods, The glowing sun never looks upon them with his beams, neither as he goes up in heaven, nor as he comes down from earth. And the former of them roared, roams peacefully over the earth, and the sea is broad back and is kindly to men. But the other has a heart of iron, and his spirit within him is pitiless as bronze. Whomsoever of men he has once seized, he holds fast, and he is hateful even to the deathless gods." There, in front, stand stand the echoing calls of the god of the lower world, strong Hades, and of awful Persephone. A fearful hound guards the house in front, pitiless, and he has a cruel trick. On those who go in he fawns with his tail and both his ears, but suffers them not to go out back again, but keeps watch and devours whomsoever he catches going out of the gates of strong Hades and awful Persephone. And there dwells the goddess loose by the god- godless de- the deathless gods, terrible Styx, elder daughter of back-flowing ocean. She lives apart from the gods in her glorious house, vaulted over the great rocks and propped up to heaven, all round with silver pillars. Rarely does the daughter of Thalmus, swift-footed Iris, come to her with a message over the sea's wide back. But when strife and quarrel arise among the deathless gods, and when any of them who live in the house of Olympias lies, then Zeus sends Iris to bring in a golden jug, the great oath of the gods from far away, the famous cold water which trickles down from a high and beetling rock. Far under the wide path earth, a branch of oceanus flows through the dark night out of the holy stream, and a tenth part of his water is allotted to her. With nine silver swirling streams, he 
winds about the earth and the seas wide back and then falls into the main. But the tenth flows out from a rock, a sore trouble to the gods. For whoever of the deathless gods that holds the peaks of snowy Olympus pours a libation of her water is forsworn, lies breathless until a full year is completed, and never comes near to taste ambrosia and nectar, but lies spiritless and voiceless on a strewn bed, and a heavy trance overshadows him. But when he has spent a long year in his sickness, another penance and a harder follows after the first. For nine years he is cut off from the eternal gods and never joins their council of their feasts. Nine full years. But in the tenth year he comes again to join the assemblies of the deathless gods who live in the house of Olympus. Such an oath then did the gods appoint the eternal and primeval water of Styx to be, and it spouts through a rugged place. And there, all in their order, are the sources and ends of the dark earth and misty Tartarus and the unfruitful sea and starry heaven, loathsome and dank, which even the gods abhor. And there are shining gates and an immovable threshold of bronze having unending roots and is grown of itself. And beyond, away from all the gods, live the titans, beyond gloomy chaos. But the glorious allies of loud crashing Zeus have their dwelling upon ocean's foundations and Cotus and Gaius and Briarios being goodly and deep roaring ocean earth shaker made his son-in-law giving him Chimopole, his daughter, to wed. But when Zeus had driven the titans from heaven, huge earth bare her youngest child, Typhus, of the love of Tartarus by the aid of golden Aphrodite. Strength was with his hands in all that he did, and the feet of the strong god were untiring. From his shoulders grew a hundred heads of a snake, a fearful dragon with dark flickering tongues, and from under the brows of his eyes in his marvelous head flashed fire, and fires burned from his heads as he glared, and there were voices in all his dreadful heads which uttered every kind of sound unspeakable, for at one time they made sounds such as the gods understood, but at another the noise of a bull bellowing aloud in proud ungovernable fury, and at another the sound of a lion relentless of heart, and at another the like sounds like whelps, wonderful to hear, and again at another he would hiss so that the high mountains re-echoed. And truly a thing past help would have happened on that day, and he would have come to reign over mortals and mortals had not the father of men and gods been quick to perceive it. But he thundered hard and mightily, and the earth around resounded terribly, and the wide heaven above, and the sea and ocean streams, and the nether parts of the earth, great Olympus reeled beneath the divine feet of the king as he rose, and earth groaned thereat, and through the two of them heat took hold on the dark blue sea, through the thunder and lightning, and through the fire from the monster, and the scorching winds and blazing thunderbolts, the, ray, the whole earth seethed, and sky and sea, and the long waves raged along the beaches round and about, at the rush of the deathless gods, and there arose an endless shaking. Hades trembled under, Trades trembled where he rules over the dead below, and the titans under Tartarus who live with Kronos because of the unending clamor and the fearful strife. So when Zeus had raised up his might and seized his arms, thunder and lightning and lurid thunderbolt, he leapt for from Olympus and struck him and burned all the mer marvelous heads of the monster about him. But when Zeus had conquered him and lashed him with strokes, Typhus was hurled down a maimed rack so that the huge earth groaned and flame shot forth from the thunder-stricken lord in the dim rugged glens of the mount when he was smitten. A great part of huge earth was scorched by the terrible vapors and melted in 
as tin melts when heated by men's art in channeled crucibles, or as iron, which is the hardest of all things, is softened by glowing fire in mountain glens and melts in the divine earth through the strength of Hephaestus, even so then the earth melted in the glow of the blazing fire, and in the bitterness of his anger Zeus cast him into wide Tartarus. And from Typhus came boisterous winds, which blow damply, except Notus and Boreas and clear Zypher. And these are a God-sent kind and a great blessing to men, but the others blow fitfully upon the seas. Some rush upon the misty seas and work great havoc among men with their evil raging blasts, for varying with the seasons they blow, scattering ships and destroying sailors, and men who... Meet these upon the sea, have no help against the mischief. Others again, over the boundless flowering earth, spoil the fair fields of men who dwell below, filling them up with dust and cruel uproar. But when the blessed gods had finished their toils and settled by force of their struggle for honors with the titans, they pressed far seeing Olympian Zeus to reign and to rule over them by earth's prompting. So he divided their dignities among them. Now Zeus, king of gods, made Metis his wife first, and she was wisest among gods and mortal men. But when she was about to bring forth the goddess bright-eyed Athena, Zeus craftily deceived her with cunning words and put her in his own belly, as earth and starry heaven advised, for they advised him so to the end that no other should hold royal sway over the eternal gods in place of Zeus, for very wise children were destined to be born of her, first the maiden bright-eyed Tritogenia, equal to her father in strength and in wise understanding, but afterwards she was to bear a son of overbearing spirit, king of gods and men. But Zeus put her into his own belly first, that the goddess might devise for him both good and evil. Next he married bright Themis, who bare the Ore and Eunomia, Dike and blooming Erinne, whose mind the works of mortal men and the Moire, who, to whom wise Zeus gave the greatest honor, Clotho, Laches, and Atropos, who give mortal men evil and good to have, and Eurnome, daughter of ocean, beautiful in form, bear him three fair checkered charities, Aglia and Euphrosyne, and lovely Thalia, from whose eyes as they glanced flowed love that unnerves the limbs, and beautiful is their glance beneath their brows. And he came to the bed of all-nourishing Demeter, and she bare white-armed Persephone, whom Adonius carried off from her mother, but why Zeus gave her to him. And again he loved Nemosene, with the beautiful hair, and of her the nine gold-crowned muses were born, who delight in feasts and pleasures of songs. And Leto was joined in love with Zeus, who holds the Aegis, and bare Apollo and Artemis, delighting in arrows, children lovely above all the sons of heaven. Lastly, he made Hera his blooming wife, and she was joined in love with the kings of gods and men, and brought forth Hebe and Ares and Elithea. But Zeus himself gave birth from his own head to bright-eyed Tritogenea, the awful, the strife-stirring, the host-leader, the unwearying, the queen who delights in tumults and wars and battles. But Hera without union with Zeus, for she was very angry and quarreled with her mate, bare famous Hephaestus, who was skilled in crafts more than any of the sons of heaven. But Hera was very angry and quarreled with her mate, and because of this strife she bare without union with Zeus, who holds the Aegis, a glorious son, Hephaestus, who excelled all the sons of heavens in crafts. But Zeus lay with the fair-cheeked daughter of Ocean and Thetis, apart from Hera, deceiving Metis, although she was full wise. 
But he seized her with his hands and put her in his belly, for fear that she might bring forth something stronger than his thunderbolt. Therefore did Zeus, who sits on high and dwells in the aether, swallow her down suddenly. But she straightway conceived Pallas Athena, and the father of men and gods gave her birth by way of his head on the banks of the river Trito. And she remained hidden beneath the inward parts of Zeus. Even Metis, Athena's mother, worker of righteousness, who was wiser than gods and mortal men. There the goddess Athena received that whereby she excelled in strength all the deathless ones who dwell in Olympus, she who made the host-scarring weapons of Athena, and with it Zeus gave her birth arrayed in arms of war. And of Amphrodite and the loud-roaring earthshaker, was born great wide ruling Triton, and he owns the depths of the sea, living with his dear mother and the Lord his father in their golden house, an awful god. And Cytheria bare to Ares the shield piercer panic and fear, terrible gods who drive in disorder the close ranks of men in numbing war, with the help of Ares, sacker of towns, and Harmonia, who high-spirited Cadmus made his wife. In Maya, the daughter of Atlas, bare to Zeus glorious Hermes, the herald of the deathless gods, for she went up to his holy bed. And Semia, daughter of Cadmus, was joined with him in love and bare him a splendid son, joyous Dionysus, a mortal woman, an immortal son, and now they both are gods. And Elamina, was joined in love with Zeus, who drives the clouds and bare mighty Hercules, and Hephaestus, the famous lame one, made Algaea, youngest of the graces, his booksome wife. In golden-haired Dionysus made brown-haired Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, his buxom wife, and the son of Cronos made her deathless and on aging for her. In mighty Hercules, the valiant son of neat-ankled Elamina, when he had finished his grievous toils, made Hebe, the child of great Zeus, and gold-shod Hera, his shy wife, and snowy Olympus, happy he, for he has finished his great works and lives amongst the dying gods, untroubled and unaging all his days. And Perseus, the daughter of Ocean, bare to unwielding Helios, Circe, and Aetes, the king, and Aetes, the son of Helios, who shows light to men, took to wife fair-cheeked Edea, daughter of Ocean, the perfect stream, by the will of the gods, and she subject to him in love through golden Aphrodite, and bare him neat-ankled Medea. And now farewell, you dwellers on Olympias." and you islands and continents, and thou briny seas within. Now sing the company of goddesses, sweet-voiced muses of Olympus, daughter of Zeus, who holds the ages, even those deathless ones who lay with mortal men and bear children like unto gods. Demeter, bright goddess, was joined in sweet love with a hero Aeson in a thrice-plowed fallow, in the rich land of Crete, and bear Plutus, a kindly god who goes everywhere over land and the seas wide back. And him who finds him, and into whose hands he comes, he makes rich, bestowing great wealth upon him. And Harmonia, daughter of golden Aphrodite, bear to Cadmus, Eno, and Semele, and fair-cheeked Agave, and Atune, whom long-haired Aristeus wed, and Polydorus also in rich crowned Thebe. And the daughter of Ocean Cario was joined in love of rich Aphrodite with stout hearted Chrysora, and bare a son who was the strongest of all men, Gerinus, whom mighty Hercules killed in sea girt Eurythia for the sake of his shambling oxen. And Eos bare to Thesonus, brazen-crested Memnon, king of the Ethiopians, and the lord Emethion, and to Calpheus she bore a splendid son, Strongphaetion, a man like the gods, whom 
when he was a young boy in the tender flower of glorious youth with childish thought, laughter-loving Aphrodite seized and caught up and made a keeper of her shrine by night, a divine spirit. And the son of Aeson, by the will of the gods, led away from Aetius, the daughter of Aetius, the heaven-nurtured king. And when he had finished the mighty grievous labors, which the king, overbearing Pallas, that outraged and presumptuous doer of violence, put upon him. But when the son of Aeson had finished them, he came to Aeolocus after long toil, bringing the coy-eyed girl with him on his swift ship and made her his buxom wife. And she was subject to Aeson, shepherd of people, and bare a son, Medusus, whom Chiron, the son of Felira, brought up in the mountains, and the will of great Zeus was fulfilled. But the daughters of Nereus, the old man of the sea, Salmthe, the fair goddess, was loved by Aeacus through golden Aphrodite and bare Phocus, and the silver-shod goddess Thetis was subject to Peleus and brought forth lion-hearted Achilles, destroyer of men. And Cytheria, with the beautiful crown, was joined in sweet love with the hero Antius and bare Aeneas on the peaks of Ida with its many wooded glens. And Circe, the daughter of Helius, Hyperion's son, loved studfast Odysseus and bare Agrius and Latinus, who was faultless and strong. Also she brought forth Telegonus, by the will of golden Aphrodite, and they ruled over the famous Tyrians, very far off in the recess of the holy islands. And the bright goddess Calypso was joined to Odysseus in sweet love, and bare him Nausotheus and Nasonian. These are the mortal goddesses who lay with mortal men and bear them children like unto God. Now, sweet-voiced muses of Olympus, Daughters of Zeus, who holds the ages, sing of the company of women. The Theogony by Hesiod. This was just a tale of the generation of the gods of an initial war, an initial war between the gods and the titans and the generations of the gods. We ended with a genealogy that combines, that connects this war of the gods through the generation of human celestial hybrids to the histories that we know that are present in the Iliad and Odyssey that we see in the tales of, of the ancient Greeks that we sort of look back to as the first part of our history, the Western mind. So we can just simply know that we've gone through a journey right, from where we are now to those oral histories, the epic poetry of Homer, the Iliad and Odyssey, to the human celestial hybrid creatures that came about from the warring of gods and titans, right? That express something like a cataclysmic event of thunderbolts, right? All the way back to the initial generations of the titans. <clears throat> and so this experience and from this experience you can hold in your mind the generation of god the theogony the generations of god the genealogies of god but because you can hold that all in your mind at least in the memory of the experience i would invite you to explore the identity what or how is it possible for you a human mortal to hold in your mind this history, and the, the actual generation of these gods, understanding that perhaps the gods that we've heard about on, on the one hand are very historical creatures, 
but on the other hand are something like the divine commander, creatures of our mind and archetypes. How is it that you can hold both of these perspectives in your mind? And you likely can't hold the whole picture in your mind. That's fine. We have the earth, we have the histories, we have this literature to do that for us. What I'm inviting you to do is find identity with the ground, to find identification with your heart and mind, with the ground from which all these gods emerge, all this creativity emerge, and just to be with that. Thank you for being with me as we read together The Theogony by Hesiod. May you generate God and God consciousness in your life and actions for the benefit of you, your relations, and the earth. Thank you. Amen.